So thank you. I'm glad to see the large audience. And when Albert had uh, invited me uh, for the presentation I'll give tomorrow, I thought, well, I have this very interesting shorter talk, maybe shorter, uh, that uh, might be fun to give. And then he said, could you re relate it to explainable AI? And I thought, well, it'll have to be a longer talk, <laughs> probably. <laughs> But uh, as I went through it, I was quite intrigued to find that there was a theme that I hadn't worked out before. So I thank you for the, uh, the stimulus. Uh, so the, uh, the title, of course, is uh, Robotically Mediated Exploration Undersea and on Mars. So we have uh, an undersea robotic vehicle, and we have the Mars Exploration Rovers, which uh, the two Spirit and Opportunity, that mission is now officially over after uh, some uh, 13 years for opportunity. And so I've had the chance to participate uh, in different ways on, on both of these missions. And what, what happened is two years ago, I had the chance to be on board the uh, Okeanos Explorer. And that's a, uh, a ship that's uh, owned and operated by NOAA. NOAA is the United States National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, even I have to refer to. So they deal with the seas, fisheries, they're part of the Department of Commerce, so the National Weather Service, and they, they serve business uh, and the citizens in, in that respect. And um, they also operate some of the, the satellites, the uh, weather satellites. So I'm gonna provide um, a, an overview of the Okeanos uh, exploration system, and you'll see why I emphasize this notion of a system and how it fits. And I'll do some comparisons at the end to the Mars Exploration Rover missions. Uh, and what I really wanna get across is this idea of a work system, and it's something I'll be talking a lot more about uh, tomorrow as a way of understanding people's activity in some setting uh, so that we can understand the opportunities for automation and AI in particular, and we know the requirements uh, for how these systems should interact with people. What do people need? How could people's understanding and work and routine work be uh, automated or amplified? And uh, the same points go for explanation. So it's a, really a design methodology that I'm getting across and that will be illustrated by the Okiana system. So this is not a technical talk in the sense of how do the robots, uh, how are they uh, actually internally uh, put together and work, and these are tele-operated robotic systems. This is not a programmed, the Okeanos Explorer is not programmed in the way the, uh, the Mars rovers are. Uh, but I will get into some of those uh, more technical aspects uh, tomorrow. So this theme of exploration has really, for me, uh, persisted uh, ever since I, I, when I first went to NASA in 98. And uh, of course my background is uh, cognitive science and uh, how do people think and do their work, uh, how, uh, how are they reasoning, what is their knowledge, and how does that relate to their tools and so on. And I, brought, I got into this broader perspective on relating people, tools, and environment, so the idea of a work system when I joined with anthropologists at the Institute for Research on Learning in the 1990s. So I was struck because NASA talks about exploration all the time, space exploration. But as I knew as a cognitive scientist, we had done very little work on the nature of exploration as it normally occurs. There was work on scientific discovery, but the work that was so influential in the 80s was mostly feeding in a set of data and looking for equations and looking for patterns, and that was called discovery. And I found myself out in the Canadian Arctic on Devon Island, uh, working with geologists and, and biologists and seeing how did they actually survey? Where did they go? How did they spend their time? And I, I've written quite a bit about that. I had the chance uh, to work on, uh, in Pasadena with the Mars Exploration Rover Science Team, observing how they did their work in planning, what they were gonna do next, and how they would program uh, the robotic uh, operations. And I also observed a, uh, a team in Arizona that was uh, managing uh, a lander, a fixed spacecraft in the Arctic of Mars. That was called the Phoenix mission. Uh, these people all had on, came in one day, on the back of their, uh, their shirts, they had, uh, let, they had written down, let's rasp the white stuff now. 
and somebody on the web had seen something that looked like ice and, and was saying on the web, why aren't the scientists sampling this stuff that looks like ice? And it turned out it wasn't part of their plan to sample that preliminary trench. And that became a whole issue in, in my study of Murr and Phoenix of the relation between uh, systematicity and serendipity. And when you're doing exploration, there's a lot of serendipity. And how do you maintain a systematic scientific approach when you're being drawn to do different things uh, at all times? We also developed uh, part of my uh, more computer science type work was the multi-agent system called Mobile Agents that here you see geologists using uh, on uh, the Kilauea area of Hawaii. Uh, that was designed originally to be used by the Mars, uh, future Mars astronauts in, in doing their, to make them self-reliant in uh, gathering their data and, and knowing where they are and managing their resources and so on. So that's a whole separate talk. I need to be invited back to talk about mobile agents. Uh, so I went on 17 different expeditions and, and it's just my point that this was, for me, a kind of a capstone now to be working with oceanographers. So the, the Okeanos system, this is an overview of it. And what's interesting about it is that there's only two scientists on board, one geologist and one biologist. And they're working with the engineers who are managing the, uh, the two robotic systems. One is called Sereos, and it's suspended on up to six miles long. I'm sorry, but everything in my, I, <laughs> it's on the mile side. I can translate for you, but it's on 10 kilometers. Uh, and it's, it's a, like a very strong steel cable, and it moves up and down with the ship. And then there's what's called a soft tether, which uh, I'll shift for you, 30 meters long, uh, going to the, the robotic system proper, known as Deep Discoverer, so you'll see me refer to D2, or the ROV, Remotely Operated uh, Vehicle. So they're doing all of the work in managing the, the exploration here, but most of the guidance is coming from remote science team. And so Noah's idea was that far more people could be involved by not putting them all on the ship. And so you have a distributed team, it's international. Anyone, you can see this uh, on your laptop computers, but they have high definition video that they're getting if they're a member of the team, and where they're at one of uh, seven uh, exploration command centers that NOAA set up in, mostly in museums uh, in, in the US. So the scientists are, are communicating in real time with the two scientists on board who are communicating with the engineers. And they also have a chat room, this online text where they can all talk to each other. They mostly know each other from a, lo a lot of uh, interactions in the past. And they have a formal way of uh, logging at each moment what they're seeing. And they put in the Latin names for things. Uh, and they're also talking over the phone uh, at, at all times. So uh, D2 cost uh, a couple of million dollars. It's, been, it's really a second generation based on a, a design and a ship by Robert Ballard. Ballard, you may know as the name, as the oceanographer who uh, at Woods Hole, I believe originally, maybe still, I was involved with Titanic and Cameron and finding uh, the Titanic, much smaller system than this, kind of a little uh, microscopic image of it. Uh, so you can see that, um, actually talking about microscopic, there's a, a Zeiss lens on here that provides almost microscopic uh, imagery that's far better than they ever saw with their submersibles. So they're getting this now back on their laptops at home. And if they were under sea, they wouldn't be able to do this, but also of course, when they do their submersibles, they're only going down a few hundred meters, and we're going down uh, thousands uh, for, for this. So this is exploring an area that most of them are not familiar with. So we're using the cameras on Serios, which remember is moving with the ship, to always uh, have a view of the ROV, and it's providing some of the lighting, but you can see there's a lot of very powerful lighting from B2 itself. Uh, and so, what they're doing is they're deploying this every day, um, and they're able to do uh, maintenance on it every day, and they're doing this over several weeks for every expedition, and maybe three, four, five expeditions during the year. They're actually, this summer, going to be around uh, Halifax and Nova Scotia, and they're gonna be moving down the, the North Atlantic. Uh, I, I was gonna see a moment, I was in a very different area. 
Uh, so they plan the dives uh, weeks in advance with the team. Anyone, again, who's on the team can participate. And then we work out the detailed plan of exactly what traverses, how far down, which part of the seamount, where are we gonna go? We'll do that the night before, after we've collected some bathymetric or what you think of as topographic details about the geology of where we're located. So I started my work in the Exploration Command Centers. Uh, I was associated with uh, the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Center in Fort Pierce, Florida. Uh, it happens to be about 20 minute drive from where my mother spends the winter. So it was very easy and there's a connection that we made with the Institute, I'll tell you in a moment. So I, I was doing work at the Exploration Command Center at Harbor Branch, uh, associated with the University of Florida. And then I had the chance to spend a couple of weeks uh, working with Chris Kelly, the lead scientist in the Pacific at uh, the University of Hawaii in Manoa. I have to say, you know, it's difficult to be paid to be working and living in Honolulu for a couple of weeks, uh, but you know, someone, you know, so has to do it. <laughs> someone's got to do it, as we say. Uh, and it was great because Chris and I were involved. We have this magnificent high definition display. It's super close up. This is something that might be, you know, just a couple of centimeters high. And uh, we were again seeing it unlike anything they've ever seen. They're always identifying new species. Uh, and Chris and I in here are talking on the telecon to the scientists on the ship. Uh, we hear the engineers and we have all these people in the chat room, maybe up to 20 people or so, who are interacting and commenting uh, on what we've seen. So these are examples of uh, some of what you can see. You can see this yourself. Uh, I had done a lot of work with the geologists, so I was fascinated to see there was a lot of geology. And it's one of those things I realized when I uh, took up scuba diving that it's like walking, doing a EVA, we'd say, on another planet. You're, you're down there. It's quite fascinating. You can also deploy, we can take uh, samples um, with a robotic arm. Again, all teleoperated, controlled remotely from the ship. And we can apply a temperature probe, here you see, to a hydrothermal vent. Um, Again, you have these kind of magnificent uh, uh, views. And it was one of the things I learned, I had no idea, that everything we were seeing was an animal, even though it looked like a lot of plants. But they, and then they explained to me, well, there are no plants below the level where there's photosynthesis, which is a few hundred meters. Uh, it's just one of the things I was pointing out to them. Maybe you should mention that to the public on the phone. Uh, because it's not <laughs> obvious to most of us. Even, I mean, we would know that's probably an animal. But what was really intriguing to me as I spent my time is they had this other quadrant they showed uh, where I could see the two scientists in the back. Here's Shirley Pomponi, uh, who was really my champion in getting me involved. She was a, a biologist working with the geologists here. And then I've got a bunch of engineers. And I could hear them talking to each other. And, uh, and I was wondering, how are they actually coordinating all this work? Uh, because they, they didn't. Uh, it just it was hard to study and to understand it. So uh, after all of my observations in the ECCs, I, I told them I, I really needed to get on board. And so I, I wrote a proposal for them. And I used the same format that I had used for the Mars Exploration Rover Studies. My main question was always, what accounts for the quality of the work? How is it that they're succeeding? How is it that they're doing so well? And then talking to the scientists, where are the frustrations? Where, what tools would enable you to do your work better? Uh, so how does it all come together? And then what are some opportunities for uh, changing the work system? And, um, and I was especially interested in how the, the design of the system was affecting the participation of the remote scientists. So the, really, Shirley's question to me was uh, how is it going to change uh, being an oceanographer if we can't go to sea? How can you do oceanography without going to sea? And I thought about it and said, well, surely, how could you do planetary science without going to Mars? <laughs> Nobody was asking that question. They well, people, lots of scientists want to go to Mars. But, uh, and, and so she actually came to see, as we did the study and she got more involved, that the kind of close-ups, the participation, of so many other people, the new regions of the vast ocean of the planet that were being opened up, all of these were very positive changes uh, for, 
for oceanography. Now, I could probably go on for an hour telling you about the ship. I have never been to sea before. Um, and there were uh, 45 people on board, and we were just like a village to ourselves. Uh, able to make uh, a certain amount of uh, water that, that could be used, recycling, cleaning uh, some of the waste. Uh, of course, the, the, the electricity, everything being uh, produced on board. There were 23 crew people who operated uh, the ship, and they consisted of uh, NOAA core, the NOAA core people, C-O-R-P-S. <laughs> and uh, they're actually a service of the U.S. military. They, they're noted for not having uh, uniforms in general, and they don't carry guns. And uh, they're like the, the medical uh, health corps. Uh, and so they're the officers that run the ship. And then there's what are called wage mariners who belong to a union, and they are, um, uh, they're working nine to five. And they get paid overtime. If, if the B-2 is coming back at 6 p.m., we, we have to pay them more. I also found out that Ballard was able to keep the, the rover, uh, the ROV down 24 hours a day because he worked with uh, foreign uh, sailors that didn't have to belong, that NOAA didn't, re it wasn't under NOAA's requirement that they belong to the Union. Uh, so Ballard was able to have uh, maybe much more efficient operations. Um, there were also half of the people were called augmentators. There's actually was a sign when you came on and off the ship to show if you were on board, and I was listed there as an augmentator. And this consisted of the NOAA coordinator, who was managing the whole expedition. She had amazing authority. Two science leads that I mentioned, the biologist and the geologist, and two mapping leads who would do the bathymetric mapping overnight as we went to a new area, and a science data manager who was recording and logging, uh, especially the samples that, that we were taking. In other words, uh, 15 other people who worked for a company called, as part of the Augmentators, uh, the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration, and I think it's a not-for-profit. Not there are nine ROV engineers, and there are six, six, six cinematographers who are taking this very high-definition video and editing it, and then sending lower resolution uh, back to Earth. And uh, the problem with, was with the bandwidth that we couldn't send the raw data back. We needed to have the cinematographers on board. So there's a bit of technology that could lower your costs uh, and simplify the mission uh, incredibly. But, but it, was, uh, it was great to have them on board. Uh, there was one more person, uh, and that was me. And they, they gave me the role. They called me VIP, which <laughs> was a little awkward. I had to explain to people that was to make me feel better because I was the only one on the ship who wasn't being paid for being there. <laughs> Though, uh, you know, uh, a couple weeks in uh, the South Pacific on an expedition for free, I, you know, uh, good food, very good food. So we left from, I was quite lucky, as much as interesting as Halifax might be, uh, we left from American <laughs> Samoa, uh, a place I had never been. Uh, and uh, had to spend some time in Hawaii on my way there. Uh, and we were on a two-week uh, traverse here, uh, and uh, we dived on uh, 13 uh, seamounts. So that's mostly, so it allows you to, provides a, a gradation of uh, ecology, of life areas, and you start low and you work your way up over maybe a couple hundred meters in the course of the day. The deeper you are, the longer it takes, maybe hours to get the ROV down to the right depth. So that means that's going to limit the traverse that you can do. Um, on the, um, we had one stormy day on day four. There was a tropical cyclone uh, that was causing a lot of squalls. And to me, <laughs> this is what I love about ethnography and this kind of study, because you don't have any vested interests. I'm not an oceanographer. I'm, I'm not someone responsible for the ship. I'm allowed to just look at it and say, this looks really stupid. You know, so, and what I learned with the Mars Exploration Rovers is whenever something looks stupid, you know you're about to learn something very interesting <laughs> about these people because they're not stupid people. And there's something about what they have to deal with that you just didn't realize was part of the challenge of them doing their work. And I had no idea that it's very hard to know the weather in the middle of the Pacific because you have very few stations 
of places that can report the weather to you. And you might have some balloons that are highly scattered and you have satellites. Uh, and there can be lots of local conditions hundreds of miles away from uh, land. And, uh, and so that's why we got stuck. And so I spent all of a day literally in my bunk hanging on and uh, with a little bit of drugs and watching videos and literally I'm just like being thrown around. Uh, but I never got sick and I actually ate quite well that day, so uh, no problem. On the 11th day, we headed back down to pick up uh, the place that we had, uh, we had missed. It was also fascinating, just to give you some of the logistics. You have the dateline, the international dateline goes through here, and we had, at the end, we had two Friday sunsets and two Saturday sunrises. <laughs> and my video and my photography timestamps were a mess. And sometimes the camera and the phone and whatever was compensating, and other times it wasn't. And I had to build a whole Excel spreadsheet just to get clear in my mind that I'd never lose any time here. And how did, how did all this actually work? So I've been involved on NASA missions, but I had seen engineers working with scientists before. But uh, here on the ship, it was a small group and uh, much more tightly integrated uh, than I had seen. Uh, the engineers were fascinating because they were uh, doing what we call cross-training, uh, adopting different jobs on different days. They could all be the ROV pilot. They all learned, they made sure everybody could learn to do that in the, in the group of nine. And they loved to <coughs> parents. Here's uh, probably one of the youngest guys on board. He's, he's lashing a rope to the soft tether, and it's going to be used to pull in D2 when we're retrieving it uh, at the end of the day. Here's Santiago, the biologist, who's uh, curating, taking one of the samples out of the sample box. Very, very cold water, by the way. And, uh, and, and then getting it into the lab. Uh, here we are with the commanding officer, the CEO, uh, and the, the, uh, the deputy officer, the mapping lead, and uh, Kelly, the, uh, the uh, expedition coordinator. Uh, these briefing meetings were held at 9 o'clock every morning. They were the best meetings I've ever seen in my life. They would last five to 10 minutes. The only person sitting was the commanding officer, and he had kind of a lounge chair there. It was very relaxed. Everybody else stands. And all we would do would be to identify the topics, the conversations of who needed to talk to whom about what. And rather than all sitting there and listening to everybody talk about every single issue, they, he would just call after 10 minutes at most, break. And everybody would then go and talk to the person to figure out what we need to talk about. There was a problem with the water system. There was a problem with the weather, you know, whatever it might be. Um, here you see on the fan tail, it's this kind of a secondary bridge that we use for uh, when we're uh, deploying and retrieving uh, the robotic systems. This is a, an A-frame, um, which is conventional. I think I, do I have the right image? Oops. I guess, yeah, the, this is the A-frame. It's kind of a funny angle. Uh, that's conventional on the back of uh, ships for bringing things up. That's Serios is brought up and down with that. And then there's a side crane here that uh, they attach and bring D2 over uh, and, and lift it up and down uh, over the side. So um, all of that. Now, one way I like to abstract what I'm seeing, I call it dependent hierarchy. I got this from Tony uh, Wilden, uh, Wilden. And it's a way of showing um, a system where there are these independent subsystems that have their own organization and their own integrity and their own way and their own uh, career paths and, and rules and so on. So we have those wage mariners and, and uh, the, the NOAA Corps. We have an expedition uh, management and, and process and the roles and activities, some most of which is located back in Washington. And then we have the engineers, most of whom are on board, and uh, the, the science team, which you know, as I said, most of it is not on board. And so if you want, this is, I view this as like a, a kind of a model that you can use for explaining how an expedition is managed and how it runs. And if I wanted to say, well, today we didn't have a dive, uh, we could use this to explain, uh, well, why not? You know, there was something wrong with the ship. Uh, the conditions weren't right. Uh, the expedition did not plan to go there. There was some discrepancy of the location, uh, problem with the ROV. Uh, the scientists uh, were 
changing their mind about how long to spend in one place. It's and, 11 o'clock. And so on. Okay. I need to move along. <laughs> so uh, so this, I find this notion of a uh, dependent hierarchy very useful for describing uh, an exploration system. And I did that in the Mars Exploration Rovers. Uh, and it's a good way of understanding how roles and activities uh, interact. So I'm going to show you a video in a moment of the, uh, the control room. I spent most of my time here sitting actually in the mapping lead seat to the left, uh, left of the biologist and the geologist. So we're in, in this back row. And then we have the three engineers in front. You have the uh, ROV nav. So he's communicating with, in this particular team, they were all guys. Um, he's communicating with the bridge and coordinating the relation of the, the ship to D2. So the, the, the commanding officer might say, well, the, the officer who's actually not the commanding officer, but the operations officer would say, I've got a problem with the wind. I've got a problem with the waves. I need to head more in one direction. I need to move. I'm having trouble, whatever. And so that would be coordinated back to the E2 pilots to know they need to, they can't stay where they are. They're going to have to leave maybe in five minutes or they're going to be able to stay if that's been a request from the scientists. So you have the pilot who's uh, teleoperating, I think on seven degrees of freedom joystick here, the hydraulic thrusters of uh, D2. The co-pilot is managing Serios uh, in terms of uh, positioning it and having its cameras pointing so that we have uh, D2 uh, in sight. There's a zillion, I think I counted 40 displays in this room. Uh, and uh, there's some redundancies, but here you see the bathymetric uh, down in here. Uh, and at this particular moment, when I took the photograph, we were in the morning uh, deployment uh, of, of the systems. The cinematographer is one more person you're going to see is off to the right, and he's again uh, effectively part of this uh, engineering team. Uh, one tidbit I got on board, I realized that uh, I and two of these two scientists were the only ones with PhDs on the ship, and that, that was very different from being, say, a NASA AIM Center or an AI lab. Uh, but a lot like being at an operations center for NASA, so like being in Houston at uh, the Johnson Spacecraft Center where there's relatively few PhDs walking around. Uh, just like on Mars now, the engineers are responsible for the safety of the technology, making sure that we don't uh, hit anything, and that we are everything, <laughs> we're not breaking any of our cables and so on with all this power going through them. Uh, and they carry out the requests of the scientists insofar as they can to take a sample here, to do a detailed uh, a photograph here, uh, move on. We've already seen 10 of those things. We don't need any more images. Uh, and the key thing is that they will suggest to the scientists something that could be done. That surprised me on the Phoenix mission, where engineers would say, you know, the lighting's going to be good tomorrow. We can do a microscopic image, this is on Mars, of, of this rock on that side that I, I think you might be interested in. So you would get those suggestions from the engineers who, of course, were working for years uh, with the scientists and would have a sense of what was uh, going on. So now in the video, which runs a couple of minutes, I'll play most of it, I think, because uh, you'll hear more of the science being discussed. I, uh, there's going to be an inset <clears throat> in the upper left hand corner, which is the public feed. And so all of the sound that I'm playing is coming from the public feed. You would have heard that on your laptop or your desktop computer at home. And uh, it, uh, it, took, it took some effort for me to synchronize my handheld camera to that, but I think I succeeded. And you're going to see a sampling that occurs. The, uh, you're going to see that the pilot, ROV pilot, is very much managing as he sits in the center here. Again, that's a navigation guy. He, you're going to see him make a remark uh, to the pilot of some information he's just received from the captain. Or the, well, it's not, they never call him captain, the operations officer. Uh, and then uh, you'll see references of uh, the ROV pilot speaking to the cinematographer. And I move uh, to show you that at that moment. Uh, he'll also refer to the watch leads, and the watch leads I haven't looked this up, but I was just wondering about it the other night. It must be a term that goes way back in uh, sailing history. And it's a reference to the, the two scientists, to watch lead one and watch lead two. And he'll say something like, uh, it's going to be hard for us to 
to get to keep the the animal that's on top of the rock uh, as we as we sample here. Oh, and the, the sponge is attached to the rock. So oh, excellent well, sample. <laughs> I didn't see. I thought it was attached to the one in front of it. We're going to lose that sponge, though, unfortunately. Watch it. That's not going in the bio box. Uh, it doesn't fit, right? Yeah. yeah, but we can uh, certainly image. Yeah, let's image it, and uh, hopefully we'll still be able to record the. Uh, Use the skeleton. Chris Kelly's going uh, like this. The arm sampling. Okay, go ahead, video. Tilting you up. So the sponge is like. And with that move, like this, the one we're observing right now, rely on the, on those, on the energy store of those chemical bonds, the photosynthetic organisms, uh, oh, incorporated at the surface of, this, of the ocean, and. The organic material contained that energy uh, sinks down to the seafloor in the form of dead microscopic organisms that sink, uh, as well as larger particles. So this, it could be fish that die and fall off. So the fish you can feed on the zooplankton and phytoplankton. Sorry, and zooplankton is more animals or that eat those microscopic plants so or algae. Like a good one there, Bacteria. Sure. It's hard to tell what we have underneath these ferromanganese crusts, but uh, we'll, we'll take it. It's a little thin. Geologist. But, all right, we'll put it in the box for you. Okay, thank so, you. As that organic matter yeah. sinks down the water column, it the starts getting consumed. We use the term remineralized. So, reversing the process of okay. yeah. going from energy storing chemical bonds in organic matter and then using that energy, the organic microscopic organisms, and uh, as well as large organisms, use that energy to live. Uh, so you're hearing all the explanations. There's a lot of explanation going on here uh, all the time. I'll come back to that moment in a moment. But obviously, the two scientists are narrating everything that they're seeing uh, as they go along. Uh, the other thing I see that I haven't quite uh, recognized so much before, is that the ship is moving <laughs> during this whole time. And I've, of course, become quite accustomed to all of this. Uh, and as, I don't know if you've ever had any experience, but when we came into uh, Appia, Samoa, uh, and you walk on the land, it suddenly feels like the land is moving all around <laughs> you because you're used to that continuous <laughs> motion. Uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, so that's very typical there of that interaction. Uh, so I, I came to refer to this as a kind of compartmentalized activities uh, that we're always interacting with each other. And that's what I mean, that each of these systems, the, the engineering, the science, it has to have its own integrity and applying its own sense of standards and quality and their own objectives, but they're in obviously real time, continuous interacting with each other to the point that the engineering and scientists are um, I'm always reluctant to use the word collaborating. They're cooperating, and there's some degree of collaboration in the gathering of the data. And the reason I would be reluctant because the, the scientists are not qualified really to uh, make judgments about what, to, what data to gather. They're really making it possible and uh, offering these opportunities, as I said. And they're, they're using their uh, capabilities to provide the kind of data that, that they've learned uh, the scientists want to have. Um, so these middle boxes are uh, part of what I would call an activity analysis. Uh, so we're not talking about their task, their functions they're supposed to be doing, which is very broadly uh, with their behaviors. How, what are they uh, uh, doing at any particular time? Uh, and so I pointed out about the, the, when we see all the technology here, it isn't just about automating. But for these people, it's mostly about sharing information. What, uh, what I'm seeing now, what I'm thinking now, uh, what I'm doing now. So it's really, you could think of a lot of the visual, those displays, is technology in helping everyone to coordinate with each other to do some degree of cooperative work. And it's providing an explanatory function as well. Uh, and different people have different uh, understandings. The mapping lead can look at that bathymetric map and tell you much more than any of the rest of us could. 
Uh, and so when you think about a robotic explorer, and I'm gonna come to that in just a moment, imagine, and, and this is what we're headed towards, um, a, an ROV on Europa in what is putatively, possibly, an undersea liquid ocean, and not just warm ice. Uh, Europa is uh, a, uh, a large moon around uh, Jupiter. And there's been a lot of discussion, there's a mission now planning to do a reconnaissance of Europa. And Europa is thought to be one of the, the moons where there could be, life could have formed. And it's, it's now thought that the hydrothermal vents are the most likely place to look certainly for life on anywhere else in the Earth, and is arguably on the Earth, it's where life might have formed as well, hydrothermal uh, ocean vents. Uh, there was another video that uh, Cameron uh, did with, with oceanographers. So when you think about a robotic system, how much of this can we automate? How much of the work uh, that's involved? And I'll show you another, uh, another way of showing this, but it becomes a, begins to become a framework for designing a mission that's gonna have more unsupervised or some unsupervised robotics. So let's go through quickly now in the comparison of um, the uh, ocean, the uh, Okeanos Explorer to uh, the Mars Exploration Rover. Um, they have, uh, there's many advantages that I've pointed out some of them. We have a lot of cross-disciplinary collaboration occurring, especially in the chat room and telecoms are just explaining things to each other and asking questions all the time. Uh, the whole system is promoting learning and especially the exploration command centers, uh, which have the public involved. Uh, NOAA has done a great deal to emphasize public awareness and interest in what's occurring. Uh, and of course the participation has been uh, enhanced uh, greatly, and it's true also uh, for the, uh, the Mars Exploration rovers. What is striking is they, they make some of the same complaints, and boy, they have uh, complaints. Uh, they, they all tell you this is so slow, As a, especially on Mars, where uh, you, know, you might be able to go over you know, 10 kilometers in a day surveying. That's something with the Mars rovers that you know, we might have to take 10 days, and we might actually stop in one place and and maybe a month or two months later before we move again. That's been especially the case in Curiosity, where they'll stay the Mars Science Laboratory uh, mission. The, they all recognize there's very limited views. <laughs> there's, the cameras are only looking in one place. And if you were there, you could turn around, you could get a better perspective of context. Uh, and of course, there's an effort to do that uh, with these systems, but it, it's limited. And they told me even in a submersible, like the one that Harbor Branch used to have, uh, you know, they had this great glass dome and they could always look at any time. It wasn't just a shared uh, camera that only one you know, was being controlled. Something, they all, both the operations are more expensive, perhaps, than what they were able to do, but of course we're going down to greater depths with going, uh, the geologists uh, for planetary science are going to places they could never go. Um, but what surprised me, I hadn't recognized, is that although people are learning from each other, there's a lot of disciplines that feel left out and uninterested. The Harbor Branch people were studying continental shelf areas. They're now down in, in habitats that they have no idea, they have no expertise about that habitat. They have to then learn, well, what's the salinity, what's the temperature where I am? How, they need to rethink everything, it's not where their research would take them. They don't, they don't have that in their proposal, well I need to go down, so, so they, they start to put in proposals to do that, but that's not where their natural interest was. And that was certainly true on Mars. You, you got the soils and minerals people, and they want to stop every three meters, and they want to do another analysis, spectral analysis, imaging, and, and you have the, the meteorology people that just want to look at the sky, and look for ice clouds, and and uh, dust devils, uh, and then you have some of the geologists that say, I want to know what's on the other side of those hills, and I could be there today if I were walking. And instead, it took them, I think, four months just to get to the top with Spirit Columbia, uh, climbing the Columbia Hills in about 2005 or so. And even though we've opened up the missions, uh, there's really practical limits. I was astounded to realize that some scientists at home, more often the senior ones, could give instructions 
uh, to ask the ship to be moved or to do something a little different uh, as they found that there was a new opportunity uh, where they were. The idea that you're sitting at home and you can affect where the ship goes and where the ROV is, is incredible, but there's limits of how many people can actually do that. And uh, obviously the, the Mars uh, exploration has rather serious limits. Uh, so looking at these, uh, this is kind of high level view, uh, you have extreme environments, but uh, the, 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 pro the demands for the rovers are much more uh, severe. This system can be repaired. This one is out there for five or 10 years with no possibility of getting in there with tools and taking it back to the garage. Uh, and the cold and the radiation, the vacuum, the, the duration just to get to Mars, nine months or six months, uh, you have the, a problem. The, that so con you know, when you're looking at also that this is a, um, a robotically, it's a robotic laboratory. It has all these instruments on board for doing analyses, which D2 doesn't have. Uh, and it's, uh, it's programmed and it's got a whole big operating system to manage its safety and so on. So it's no surprise that this costs uh, a couple hundred times, um, so let's say two, two orders of magnitude uh, more expensive. So there's big advantages of differences of live telepresence. We're not gonna have this on Europa. Uh, we're gonna have time delay like worse than Mars. Uh, it's gonna be uh, as much as I think uh, 20 to uh, 50 minutes to go to uh, Jupiter. Um, we, we can bring back uh, samples. We, uh, sampling is still a big deal that's being discussed for some time in uh, the 2020s. Uh, so it's, it's very different type of science. So I, we, we have to be careful that when we're talking about planetary missions, they're gonna be more like this. If we're talking about robotic mining or firefighting drones, or uh, undersea drones on Earth that are like doing uh, surveying of the ocean bottom, it will be more like this, where we can get uh, more direct or more daily uh, ability to, to, to manage what's happening. Um, the one of the things, since I was focusing on, a lot on the science, um, I was very struck from NASA. NASA runs their missions like they're um, they're, they're classified, and uh, you, uh, you have to, there's a very limited science team, and they can talk to their colleagues, certainly, they're pretty free to communicate, but it's very hard to get in this room, and to, you know, the way that I could get on board. Even though I had been involved with the Mars Exploration Rover, I was, when I was still at NASA, I tried to get involved on the phone, the telecon, for my Mars Science Laboratory, and I was told no, that the instruments were proprietary, and that we wouldn't want you to hear the details about these instruments. And I was like, well, this is a government-funded project. How is it so closed? Now, I had an award-winning book, so I was really struck by that bottom line, I think NASA has a lot to learn from NOAA about how to use social media and what's available uh, in terms of uh, video and so on. I mean, there's no reason why you can't have a video showing some of the discussions that are occurring here. Um, and, and so the learning, again, here's the chat room showing it. This is an actual uh, dialogue that was occurring while I was uh, on board of uh, Matt, the geologist, asking a dumb question. And then uh, uh, this is a senior, uh, he's really a biologist, yes, uh, and, uh, at uh, Manoa. And here then was a, uh, a, uh, there was a woman who speaks up in Japan uh, who uh, provides a little more information as we go on. So one way you could look at NOAA's system is that it's what we used to call it the Institute for Research on Learning. It's designed for learning. It's really thought through in all the ways. Who can learn from whom? How do we facilitate conversations throughout this system? Uh, and the different media that we can use uh, for explanation. And especially when we have a distributed work team, as we have here, it's useful. So another way of looking at the explanation is the, um, 
if I have. If we just sort of look at the, ex the scientific aspect of the work and how the, the different uh, aspects of planning uh, are involved from a high level, where are we going to go during these three weeks, to uh, where we are now, and uh, what's the plan for today, and then the detailed plan, and where we are on today's plan, to are we going to stop and take this rock <coughs> as a sample. There's discussions that you can hear as explanations <coughs> among the people uh, throughout the, this whole <coughs> process of people saying, well, why are we doing this? Why aren't we doing something else? Why are you doing it this way? Why are you having trouble doing what we said we were going to do? Uh, where did you come up with this alternative uh, plan? Uh, and so on. Uh, and that carries all the way to the, uh, the operations officer. I didn't mention, kind of side point, the ship <coughs> itself is a robot. And it's all controlled by a Microsoft Windows program. I was just blown away. And he's actually using a menu and, and dialog boxes to put in headings and and uh, speeds, uh, and whether to hold in place. Uh, and he's just programming the whole thing. And sort of to make the point, his major in college was anthropology. So uh, he, he decided uh, as he got into things that he was a little bit more interested in technology, and he became a, a NOAA a Corps officer by getting a degree in, uh, I think it was oceanography, a related system, I think ecological sustainability or something like this. So I'm getting to the end, um, and it's connected <coughs> to that, that issue about, well, what can we infer now as we're building other robotic systems, and specifically uh, one for uh, Europa? So we don't know today. We know there's an ice covering, but we don't know really uh, if, the, uh, if it's liquid, ocean, and how deep it might be. They're thinking maybe, I think, 15 to 25. Uh, see, the ice could be 15 to 25 kilometers uh, deep. I wrote that down. Uh, it's on that order, 20. So it's pretty, you have to go pretty far. You'd have to drill through this ice to get to the water. And that's, of course, done now with uh, delayed communication to Earth. And this thing has to be really unsupervised most of the time. or um, it's just going to have to proceed. And then when you're down here, you obviously can't transmit. I mean, <coughs> maybe centuries from now, a century from now, we'll have some way of leaving an antenna on the surface, and it could report what it's doing. You know, this is all way beyond where we are. But this is the kind of planning people are actually thinking through today, where what we might do in coming decades. What are we capable of? And again, what are all the things we need to be able to do, and what can we task the robot as being able to do? And when you look at the Mars Exploration Rover in particular, where we're going so slowly and we're interpreting everything, you realize there's a lot of interpretation of what you're seeing and replanning that's occurring every single day. So this, uh, does the robotic system have to be capable of, of that degree of understanding, of, of analyzing the data it's received, knowing whether it's the right quality? And one way I like to do this is to turn this around <coughs> and to say, to what extent does the system, is the system going to be learning from the people? That the people have to explain their interests to the robotic system, and the people need to explain what to do under certain circumstances and to set priorities. And so we're imagining you know, a very capable agent here that can discuss with you just the way a person would, uh, is like and beyond even delegating <coughs> to a graduate student uh, how to do the work. So there's a really problematic of how much the system could understand. But again, uh, you can certainly imagine that once it's able to communicate with people that there's a, a lot of negotiation and give and take about what was observed. Another thing to keep in mind is these missions, at least today, you can't send back all the data that you received. If you followed the New Horizons mission that flew to the uh, what's it called? Thule, Thule, the Kuiper Belt object that looked like two potatoes. I don't know if you saw that network oh, together. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's taking months and months for us to get the data where it flew by you know, in, in a matter of minutes, I expect, uh, because of the slow, of course, that's a transmitter that uh, you know, doesn't have a lot of power. And uh, so that this bandwidth is a big issue even for the Mars rovers. 
of you can't get back everything, and you need the system needs to do some filtering. We have very limited <coughs> filtering today. The Mars rovers can take photographs of the sky, send back pictures that look like clouds, ice clouds. So we're doing that filtering. You can program the Mars rovers, at least the MER was programmed, that when you get to a rock that has the following color and texture characteristics, take a picture of it. Because we just want you to get over there. But if you see something that looks like this on the way, take a picture of it. Don't just go right by it. So it's just the very beginning. Oh, so dust devils. We, we were taking pictures of the, the sky and area. If you take, send back only the pictures of swirling uh, sand. This is, is going to be uh, way beyond that. So I'm now pretty much at the end. Um, what was interesting, I'm going to show you another short video, really shifting gears to life on board. Uh, we did not see another ship, and certainly no civilization, the whole time we were out there for two weeks. And that really amazed me. And I always have in the back of my mind this uh, voyaging on another planet. And I was wondering, you know, 45 people, you could almost imagine, were in this, on this water where, as far as we are concerned, the entire planet is covered in water. Uh, we saw an atoll, Rose Atoll, very mysterious marine preserve. Uh, that was it. Pretty interesting when we saw it. Uh, but you really have a sense of this community and, and uh, being at sea in that way. So this final piece, uh, I, uh, in the evenings, people were able to have time off. And uh, I happened to come up on the, on the area above the fantail. And uh, there were two, uh, two of the engineers up there. They were listening to a, a very uh, well-known song to me. Uh, and uh, just having a great time. Mm -hmm. Boy, nobody <laughs> ever showed me I could do that as a career. Uh, so, <clears throat> two of the things I would point out from reading my, my book about Murr and uh, David Mendel's work as a historian of science at uh, MIT, <coughs> I've seen this uh, very broad, <coughs> in many different areas, different types of robotic systems. So, uh, thank you for your attention. And, uh, thank you.